Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege to be assembled together again in your house, for the privilege to open the precious Word of God. I pray this morning your Word might minister to our hearts. And Lord, may it be spiritual food that will strengthen and encourage the hearts of your people that are gathered here today. I pray you'll use me as your servant. Lord, help me to be yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit as I preach today. And may every heart be attentive and receptive to the Word of God. And I pray if there should be those in our midst today that has never trusted Jesus as their Savior, may this be the glad day they come by faith accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we ask you now to just to bless and honor your word to your own glory. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in the book of Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. We're going to stop reading here in verse number 9. I want to call your attention this morning to especially the last two verses that I've read. Verse 7 says, The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God shall keep. And the word keep means to just control. Peace of God, control your heart and your mind. And then he instructs us down in verse number uh, 8. He tells us the things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely. The things are of good report. He said, think on these things. Think on these things. I want to preach this morning for a few moments on how to have a healthy attitude. How to have a healthy attitude. There is much sickness in this world today with, with sick attitude. Old negative, unhealthy thinking. Someone said stinking thinking just means you need a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> there may be a lot of truth in that, amen? I know a lot of people this morning who spend most of their life living on the dark side of life. Now, I'll just go ahead and confess to you this morning, I'm not always up, but I'm up more than I'm down. I've decided that I want to live on the bright side of life. I want to have a good attitude. I don't want to live on the negative side of life. I don't mean this to be ugly, but have you ever met people that didn't take them just two or three minutes to almost depress you? I mean, I know some people, and I'm sure that you do too, that there are ne never a positive word comes out of their mouth. They just seem to dwell on the negative and just talk the downside of life all the time. Well, I want you to go back with me to verse number four, where we're going to start this morning on how you can have a healthy attitude. 
Verse number four, Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I can see some of them, and Paul could see some of them, as he wrote this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I imagine in Paul's mind, he could see the reaction of some of those people when, he, when they read that, Rejoice in the Lord always. And they said, Now, Paul, Rejoice in the Lord always. Did you say rejoice in the Lord always? And so he just went ahead and added this to the verse, and he said, And again I say, Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he just seemingly said, Yes, that's what I mean. I'll just say it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, we're so accustomed to our life being controlled by the circumstances that surround our lives that we don't believe that it's possible to rejoice in the Lord always. But the key to this is in the little words, in the Lord. Didn't say to rejoice in your accomplishments because if you rejoice in your accomplishments, then you're going to be down part of the time. I don't know of anyone that's successful 100% of the time at everything they do to you. But we, we've come to the place that we, uh, we rejoice in our accomplishments. We rejoice in the atmosphere. In other words, our surroundings, the atmosphere around us has got to be just so-so in order for us to rejoice. Then a lot of people, you know, rejoice, and, and their rejoicing is based on their activity. They've got to be doing certain things and, and so forth in order to rejoice and have any joy and be happy. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but I challenge you this morning to take the word rejoice and take the word joy and go through the Scripture. Just get you a concordance and go through the Scripture and see what kind of strange relationships that joy and rejoicing have in the Bible. There are some very strange relationships with this word joy. For instance, in the book of Matthew, let me just share two or three of them with you. For instance, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, as it is known, Jesus said in verse 11, Blessed are ye, and the word blessed here means happy, happy are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, isn't that a strange relationship for joy and rejoicing to have? Somebody said, well, the reason I'm so unhappy, preacher, people's been talking about me, and somebody's lied on me, and someone has persecuted me, and I'm just so down about it. Well, you know what Jesus said? He said, happy are ye. Happy are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you <clears throat> and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then he said, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That word exceeding means surpassing the normal. Exceeding, be exceedingly glad. Don't just have a little smile, but just get tickled about it. Amen. Rejoice about it. Someone said, well, preacher, I can rejoice, but I'm having such a hard time. I'm going through this trial, and, <clears throat> and I'm having this tribulation. 1 Peter 1 and 6 says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaven is through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And if you follow that, if you follow that line of thought through the Scripture, you're going to find all these different things. For instance, again, in James chapter 1 and verse 2, James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Or when you fall into different trials, 
He said, don't just be happy about one trial, but when you get into different trials, he said, just count it joy. When you have multiple trials, count it joy. You say, preacher, are, are you really, I mean, are you serious? Well, I'm just as serious as the Bible. I'm quoting this to you out of the Bible. What it says in relation to rejoicing and so forth, Romans chapter 5. He talks about, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth, and, and, and wherein we rejoice that we have access into this grace, and so forth. And then he said, we, we glory also in tribulation. We don't just glory in our peace and our justification, but we glory also in tribulation. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that this world ought to see a strange breed of peculiar people who know how to wear a smile on their face and know how to have a healthy, right attitude in the face of adversity in the world in which we live. The world needs to see this. Rejoice in the Lord. You say, well, I can't think of anything. Are you saved? You remember those disciples came down off the mountain and met that boy that was demon-possessed and, and they'd been running around casting out devils and, you know, and casting out evil spirits and all of this. And they met this man uh, whose son was possessed with a devil and they couldn't do a thing about it. They tried and failed. You know what Jesus told them? He said, don't you rejoice because the evil spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. You rejoice in your accomplishments, you're going to be down, but you can always rejoice because you're saved. And I want to tell you something, I have never, I have never, since the day that I got saved, I have never lived one day that I could ever say that I was sorry that I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And when you're saved... You have reason to rejoice. And Paul said, if you want to have a healthy attitude, learn how to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. When you're down, just rejoice. When you're up, rejoice. When the sun is shining, rejoice. When it's raining and, and bad, rejoice. When you feel loved, rejoice. When you feel unloved, rejoice. There's always reason to rejoice. You know what the world is? The world is governed by their emotions, by the circumstances of their life, and that's why the average person who lives in the world, life is like a roller coaster to them. They're up one day and down the next. They're excited one day and they're sad the next. Their life is up and down. But there ought to be a consistency in the life of a Christian. And by the way, the man who is giving us this instruction is in a prison cell. And if you keep reading, I stopped in verse 9, but if you keep reading down in verse 11, or in verse 10, he said, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned... In whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. <clears throat> Paul said, I have learned whether I'm in jail, whether I'm free, I've learned to be content. And, and, the, and the bottom line, all that Paul is saying here is this, I refuse to let my circumstances control my life and tell me where I can rejoice or whether I can't rejoice. I refuse to allow my circumstances to dictate to me whether I'm going to be happy or sad. I'm going to be content no matter where I'm at, he said. And Paul was in prison. And if you keep reading, he said, well, I know how to be full, I know how to be empty, I know how to be exalted, I know how to be abased. But I've learned to be content. You know what a lot of Christians need to learn this morning? They just need to learn the secret of contentment that it is in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. You're never going to find contentment in this world. Not anything, 
People who think that if they had money, they'd be content. Why, you wouldn't. You'd just want more. People think, if I just had a new house, I'd be happy. You got a new house, and before long, it'd just be a house. Material things are not going to make you happy. You're not going to find your joy in the things of this world. In the Lord is the source of our joy, and it is the very grounds of our rejoicing. If you want to have a healthy attitude, learn how to rejoice. Secondly, verse number five, if you want to have a healthy attitude, recognize the Lord's presence in your life. Verse 5 said, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Now notice that word moderation for a moment. That word moderation means gentleness or it means control. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. In other words, because you have the Lord at hand, Don't let the world see you coming apart at the seams, but let them see your gentleness. Let them see your moderation. Let them see your control. Let me ask you something. If you're on the job and something goes wrong and you come apart at the seams and pitch a fit, what difference is there in you And that unsaved man on the job, it does the same thing. When you run up against an obstacle you can't get over or around or through, and I I mean, you begin to just pull your hair out and, and just live on the brink of a nervous breakdown, what difference is there in you and the unsaved world? Paul said, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And and when he's saying the Lord is at hand, I believe the the coming of the Lord is at hand, and I'm not de-emphasizing that, but in the context of this scripture, I believe what he is teaching us here is the availability of the Lord. You and I ought to be in control of our life because we have access to the Lord's presence every day that we live. He is only a prayer way. Now, it ought to change all of our attitude to know no matter where you're at this morning and what your circumstances may be, if you know you have help and you know you have the solution and you know you have the resources out of that situation, it ought to help you think better about it. And Paul said, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He's available to you. He's within your reach. What difference does it make how much money you owe tomorrow if you have accesses, if you have access to the resources to meet that bill tomorrow? Why worry and fret if you have the resources to meet that bill? Why shouldn't we let the world see our gentleness and our control? We're living in a world today that's full of pressure I mean that is that people are stressed out and we're not talking about just the unsaved world I'm talking about Christians I mean Christians are just stretched to the limits and under pressure and and so forth we've got access to the Lord the Lord's at hand thirdly this morning look in verse 6 Not only should we rejoice in the Lord always and recognize the Lord's presence in verse 5, but in verse 6 we ought to resist the temptation to worry. He said in verse 6, be careful for nothing. In paraphrase, that simply means don't worry about anything. Just don't, don't worry about it. We're so accustomed to worrying that we worry if we don't worry. I've seen people that are so content, and I've, had, and I've known people that just seem like that they took everything in stride. You ever met folks like that? 
It is so unusual for a person to take things in stride and just hold his head up and go on no matter what it is about him that, that when you finally see a person like that and he may be going through some deep waters and he may be going through some trials and heartaches and somebody will say, you know, I don't believe they care about anything. I don't believe I've ever met anybody that's as passive as they are. They just don't ever seem like they ever get concerned about nothing. Ever occurred to you they may be, be just living scripturally? <laughs> they may be better off than the rest of us living on Zantac, Caraphate. <laughs> oh, me, I know. <laughs> I'm talking about resisting the temptation to worry. What did Jesus say about it? Hold your place here. I'm not going to preach all day today. I, I promise you I'm not. Turn over here to, to the book of Matthew 6 for just a moment. What did Jesus say about this matter of worry? Look in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 27. Jesus is listing all these different things about materialism and so forth in Matthew 6. And in verse number 27, he said, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubic unto his stature? I think you could derive by that that, that the opinion of Jesus concerning this matter of worry is worthless. Worrying about all these things, he said, is just as worthless as a man who worries about him being too short. And he thinks if he, if he gives thought to it and worries about it and concerns himself about it, he'll grow taller. Who said Jesus didn't have a sense of humor? I mean, he said, which of you by taking thought can add one cubic unto his stature? Which of you by thinking about it and worrying about it and concerning yourself with it can add one cubic under your stature. Jesus said it is worthless for you to worry. I could stop right here this morning and say we're going to have a testimony service for the remaining part of this service. And I want everybody to stand up and give testimony to how much in your life has been accomplished by worry. It's, it's never accomplished anything. Why we do it, I don't know. We're just so used to it, we think it's part of life. Jesus said it's worthless. Look again in verse 32. Jesus said, and he's listing all these different things, and then he said, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. He said it's not only worthless, but he said it's worldly. Because you know what he's saying? You know what he's, what he's saying when he's saying for, all, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek? He's saying the heathen world and the unsaved world out there, that's what they do. They spend all their time worrying and fretting about what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat, and, and how they're going to be clothed, and what kind of houses they're going to live in, and all that. They spend all their time. What difference is you in, are there in you and in the world out there? Jesus said, if you worry about all these things, they worry about all those things, but Jesus said, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ever need it. Amen. So why should you worry about it? Why should you, why should you take on the... the pattern of the world and follow after the ways of the world worrying about all these things that's the way the world lives but you've got a heavenly father that clothes the lilies of the field that feeds the birds and sees every little old sparrow that falls you don't have to worry about these things verse 34 tells us that Jesus said that worry is wasteful he said take no thought for tomorrow for tomorrow shall Take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
He said, worry is like wasting today's strength on tomorrow's problems. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient, sufficient under the day, he said, is the evil thereof. In other words, there's enough to concern you, you, for you to be concerned with today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Live today. Do you know that a lot of people, their life is miserable today because they're preoccupied with tomorrow? Well, tomorrow may never come. You may never live if you're waiting to live tomorrow. Live today. Live today. Sufficient unto the days to evil thereof. Resist the temptation to worry. Let me hurry on. I'm going to be through in a moment. Verse number six. Learn to rely on the Lord for everything. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Learn how to rely on the Lord. Learn how to pray about everything and rely on the Lord about everything. If the truth could be known this morning, how much of our prayer life is spent on things, praying about things that we should have prayed about to begin with, but we went on Found out we couldn't do it. Found out we'd made a mess of things and, and then come back and then prayed about it and that's what we should have done to start with. wonder how much of our prayer life consists of that. Rely on the Lord for everything. This is a self-sufficient world. The concept of this world is for everybody to be self-sufficient with no need of God but we need to learn how to rely on the Lord for the little things just like the big things. Yes. Learn how to rely on the Lord for everything and go before the Lord and, and let your request be made known unto God. Tell the Lord what you need. I never preach on this and think about this, but what I don't think about that story about the, the missionary, I've shared this with you before. But it is so true and it is so real to where we live. The story talks about a missionary who had been out for days visiting the different villages and preaching. He was coming back home through the jungles and, and uh, going back to his home village. And he looked up and he saw a big old lion standing in his path. That missionary froze in his tracks and he looked at that lion and he said, Lord, he said, you know, I'm so tired and I'm just trying to get home to get some rest. And it'd be such an easy thing for you just to move that old lion out of my way and let me get on home. And he said no sooner than he prayed that he looked up and that old lion just kind of turned around and looked at him, wagged his tail, and walked off in a different direction. Missionary went on home. He laid down in the bed that night and tried to go to sleep. By the time he dozed off, there was a mosquito began to buzz around his ear. Kept on buzzing around his ear, buzzing around his ear. Finally, he got up, turned the light on, Tried to kill that mosquito. Swatting around at that mosquito. Never did kill it. Finally went back to bed. And every time he went back, he'd bat, doze off, go back to sleep. Here come that old mosquito again, buzzing around his ear. And up and down all night, he got up and, and, and chased that mosquito around his bedroom, trying to kill that mosquito. And before you know it, the sun came up the next morning, and he had fought that mosquito all night long and it had cost him a night's sleep that he, that he so desperately thought he needed. He said the next morning when he got up, the Lord spoke to him and he said, Son, 
I could have taken care of that mosquito just as easy as I did that line, but you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me. You want me to tell you what his problem was? He knew that line was more than he could handle. And the first thing he did was pray about it. But that mosquito was so small and insignificant that he thought he could handle it on his own. You know what most of us need to learn? We need to learn that we need to allow God to take care of the mosquitoes just like the lions in our life. And you know what the scripture said? It's the little foxes that eat up the grapes and spoil the grapes. The little foxes. And it is the little things in our life that we keep on contending with and trying to control ourselves that rob us of allowing the peace of God in our mind. And so we live in our lives in an uproar. Our attitude's bad. And we take it out on everybody around us because our life is miserable. We just need to learn how to rely on Jesus for things. Why is it then when a person gets miserable and gets bent out of shape that it rubs off on everybody around them? Huh? I get so tired trying to figure out these moody people, don't you? Trying to decide what, which side of the bed they got up on so I know how to react to them. Huh? You know what I'm talking about? Learn how to get up on the right side of the bed. You can learn how to, you can learn how to get up on the right side of the bed if you want to. You will learn how to live in Jesus and let the peace of God control and keep your heart and mind. You don't have to get up on the wrong side of the bed half the time. Well, I'm on clothes. This preaching is so good, some of you are not enjoying all of it. <laughs> but don't we, I mean, listen, you know what I think, really, I'm going to tell you this with honest truth. You know what I believe causes as much harm and does as much harm to the cause of Christ as anything that I know of. It's not Christians falling into sin. But you know what does more harm to the cause of Christ than anything? It's Christians with a bad attitude. They can do, you can do more harm to the cause of Christ with an old bad disposition and a bad attitude then you can do three times more damage to the cause of Christ that way than somebody who falls into sin. And I'm not justifying sin or belittling somebody or the seriousness of somebody who falls into sin. But I'm just saying getting drunk and committing adultery is not the only way we're hurting the cause of Christ. But a lot of us just, as, as, as I said, we just need to check up about our thinking and our attitude and learn how to live positive. Well, I'm not going to get into this, but I'm going to close. Verse 8, if it teaches us anything, it teaches us that we ought to just refuse to be negative. Think on things that are pure. A lot of people, in other words, in verse 8, a lot of people had ten times rather think about a lie than the truth. He said, think on things that are true and things that are honest, not dishonest, things that are just, not unjust, the pure, the lovely, Things of good report. You ever notice how eager and interested most people are in a bad report? They'd rather hear something bad on someone than something good. Paul said, think on good things, and true things, honest things, lovely things. Think on things of good report. And if there's any value at all in these things, he said, think on these things. Refuse to be negative. We're in a negative society. The whole concept, Brother Thomas was talking a few weeks ago on Wednesday night, the concept of this world is negative. It's geared that way. If there's any chance at all for rain today, I'll, I, I, and I didn't listen to the weather report, but a beautiful day, I can see the sun shining on the outside right now. But you want me to tell you how the weatherman read the report this morning? If there's any chance of rain at all? He didn't say there's an 80% chance of having a beautiful day today, but he said there's a 20% chance it's going to rain. Right. 
<laughs> we was talking the other night about the fellow, you know, you're on an airplane, you, you know, and, and you're about to arrive at your destination, and they come on and they say, ladies and gentlemen, buckle up. We're approaching the final descent. <laughs> it's just something that sounds bad about that. I mean, if you're on an airplane and they tell you, you're now approaching your final descent, buckle up. Negative, negative world in which we live in. We Christians ought to add some positive to this negative world. Come on, Brother Tom, I'm trying to quit. Can we as Christians add a little sunshine to this world? Could we make the effort to smile at someone today? Say a kind word, say a positive word. Be surprised what a good attitude do. And listen, just as an old bad attitude is contagious, a good attitude is contagious too. Sure is. You get around somebody that's on the upside of life, and the next thing you know, I got called up here in, in Rossville the other night. They had revival break out up there at Shiloh Baptist Church where Brother Paul O'Neill pastors last Sunday. I talked to Brother Paul on Thursday night. They've gone on through Friday night. I don't know, they've been 16, 17 people saved. And uh, they didn't announce the revival. It just broke out on Sunday morning. They decided to come back on Monday. I went up and preached on Tuesday. And, and, uh, and I wasn't there when it broke out. But you know what it did for me? It made me feel good just to get in on it and be a part of it. I got to think about it all the way home. What a blessing it'd be for something like that to break out around here. I've been praying this week for Lord, let the same thing get on here. It kind of got on me. And, and it's contagious. It's contagious. People get on the upside of life. You hear about all these churches not winning any souls to God, never baptizing any converts, churches going down, everybody talking negative. Sounds good to me to hear folks getting people saved, revival breaking out. God's still on the throne, folks. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you this morning for the resources that we have in the Lord Jesus. Lord, I haven't tried to paint a pie in the sky type Christianity today, but Lord, I've just tried to help us to see from your word that we as Christians need to be a positive influence in this world in which we live. Lord, if there's any people in this world that have a right to be happy, that have anything to rejoice about, it is we that are saved. Because the darker this old world gets, the brighter our hope gets in the Lord Jesus. I pray this morning you'll help us to get on the bright side of life, be a positive influence in this world in which we live. I pray this morning that there should be those in our midst today that have never trusted Jesus as their Savior. Lord, help them to see and realize today there's joy in being a Christian. Help them to step out of their seat when we give the invitation and come and get on their knees and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me today. Help somebody to come pray that prayer today. We'll thank you and praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.